probably noticed these Royal Orbison impression here. It's what happens when uh, you're short-sighted and you pack light. And, and, uh, but I did notice in a darkened theater, you can wear sunglasses and nobody bats an eyelid. It may be because I can't see your eyes. I don't know. So ignore these, right? I feel kind of stupid, but maybe you'll help me out and think it looks cool. OK, this is my home. It's your home. It's a planet stupidly called Earth because it's an ocean planet. I, I know we all know that 2 thirds of the planet covered by water, so the ratio is just one-third Earth, two-thirds water. That's actually wrong. As a habitat for life, the oceans are three-dimensional. It turns out that something like 94% of life on this planet is aquatic. Sorry, but we're a tiny minority living on the little bit of the Earth high enough to poke through its real atmosphere. The real atmosphere of this planet, by the way, is H2O. So, now you know where we live. Um, it's a design conference. I'm a different kind of designer. Seems to me, I'm going to upset a lot of people, but it just seems to me that there's a whole spectrum of design. Um, at the one end, um, perhaps the most glorious end, is what I would call an artist. Um, if you can operate without constraints, you're free. You're free to design the way you want. At the other end, where you're trying to do something, you're trying to work with the laws of nature, you're completely constrained. So at that end, I call that engineering. I would call myself an engineer. And when the math is finished and we get to the machine kind of the way that we want, then there's a little bit of wiggle room for design in the end in aesthetics. One of the observations is that between the artist at one extreme and the engineer at the other, it's really interesting to me that there really isn't any stress, there's no conflict. It, I think that when you engineer something to work within the laws of nature, it actually fits beautifully into our whole senses of aesthetics. I don't think there's a conflict. My whole thing really has been, after coming out of working in the oil industry and military, I just wanted to go fly in the ocean. I don't know why, but I do. We live in this ocean space. Blue space is a three-dimensional space that as humans, We've had the freedom to fly in airspace. We can go to the moon. We've got trains, planes, bicycles. But in the ocean, the biggest part of this planet, we have very limited means of going there, very limited freedom. Scuba only touches the very top skin. Conventional submersibles sink vertically as a two-dimensional solution in this beautiful three-dimensional place. It just seemed to me we needed to go fly. And this was the first attempt at that. Deep Flight One is 1996, I think. It looks kind of more like an airplane than a submarine. It actually is. But I didn't have the guts to go. I wasn't quite clear enough of mine to go all the way. That is probably 80% aircraft in the sense that it's fly-by-wire. It has um, differential elevator control. But it's part submarine. We have differential thrust on the back for yaw. No airplane does that. That was a mistake, but I was getting there. This was the next attempt. This is about the year 2000. It turns out that that Deep Flight One, I was looking at full ocean depth, by the way, and it was only built for myself. But clearly, when we launched that, I was having so much fun in that thing that you noticed a shift in the, in the public after we launched this, that people imagined themselves flying underwater. And I'd never seen that. I thought I was the only crazy person I don't think I'm crazy. I think everyone else is, by the way. I'd spent a lot of hours deep in the ocean in other conventional submersibles. I really wanted to go there. But it looks like other people now could see the idea of flying through this blue space and imagine themselves doing it. So we built a prototype two-seat trainer. That's the aviator. This, I think, was the third generation. We actually did master underwater flight a number of years ago, about 100 years after flight in air was mastered. And, but it was all built, actually, on the mathematics. It's the same mathematics, um, Bernoulli um, theory of lift. If you go back to the cruder days of flight, um, probably the first half of the last century, the mathematics were pretty simple. Air was actually thought to behave the same as water, not the other way around. Um, and that turns out to hold true, the math holds true,
providing your subsonic. So really, aviators from 1900s, probably through to really when computers came into being, um, thought of air and water as the same thing. And I'm old enough to have been trained in that era. Nowadays, if you come through um, you know, the engineering schools on either way, um, computational fluid dynamics is done by computers. You really, and they're more precise. So air and water are no longer treated as the same thing. But 50 years ago, they were. And to within a few percent, they are. So to get to the bottom of the planet, I was figuring that we needed to get away from the sinking business, because we would sink. It would take four hours to get to the bottom of the planet. I wanted to build much smaller, lighter, more elegant machines. We only allowed an hour to get down. You can't get to the bottom of the ocean, which is seven miles down, uh, by sinking slowly. The math doesn't work out. We actually need to fly down. So this is a machine that we built for Steve Fawcett. You know, he's from Chicago. That's the late Steve Fawcett. You know, Steve was lost a couple of years ago in a plane crash. He'd set the world record, ran the world solo for Bloon, um, a number of records. Steve and I worked for four years on his big secret project, which was to take the solo depth record to the bottom of the ocean, which was just set by James Cameron. But had Steve lived, he would have been there in that machine about four years ago. For the engineer designers in this room, there she is. You can see the man capsule up front. This is the only part that's pressurized. Actually, it isn't pressurized. It's kept at one atmosphere, but people seem to you get the idea better. You're not subject to ambient pressure in any of these machines. You can swoop down, come straight back up. The pressure changes on your body about 1%, that's all. Just really because of hull squeeze. The, the pressure hull here does actually squeeze. Its diameter reduces about 0.4 of an inch from the surface to full ocean depth. Full ocean depth, the atmospheric pressure around there, or the ambient pressure, is um, about 16,000 pounds per square inch. So this is an aircraft operating in a pretty hostile environment. By the way, the fluid it's in is conductive, corrosive. It's just pretty wild stuff. Um, most of this was taken up by extra flotation, um, lithium batteries, propulsion motors, and the same flight control and software as we've, we've developed for other subs. But this is my favorite machine. After that, I built one for myself. Probably could have sold the dog in the car and maybe scraped together enough pennies to go and have another attempt at the bottom of the ocean. But by now, I really was seeing the ocean space as three-dimensional. And really, this idea of depth just solves one of those dimensions. The big animals are moving horizontally. They're mainly in the twilight zone. I'm talking about the, the big mammals, whales, sharks, the big things that actually I really did want to go in among and fly with. And in order to do that, we needed a machine which would not be compromised by depth. So the goal on this was nuts to 37,000 feet. We've been there, done that. Let's just build the most elegant, um, comfortable, beautiful flying machine that I can conceive of. And that's, that's the Super Falcon. Again, the pressure hull is only a small part inside the bigger skin. This turned out to be quite a machine. It, it, the, what happened was, I don't know if you know, know the name Tom Perkins, but Tom, I think, of, he's, a, he's turned into a friend. But I hope he won't mind me calling him this. But he's like the godfather of Silicon Valley, the, the original guy down there, Darth Vader type to most people, but he's a great guy. He had built the most extraordinary boat that there's probably the most significant sailboat built in the last hundred years and what is called the Maltese Falcon if you know that. It happened to have the tallest mast, it was the biggest thing. But it's an extraordinary piece of engineering art. Tom walked into our little workshop which is small at well about the size of this theater and um, always knew somebody would. He claims it was 35 minutes. I think it was 25 minutes after walking in. He said, can you get me contracts on my desk by 10 o'clock tomorrow? And he's the only one that's really seen this stuff. So the first Super Falcon, which was this one, was actually for me, but Tom wanted that one. So Tom got that, and I got the next one. So here is the series. 
Deflight One about um, 16 years ago, that one, there's another one in between. Went to two seat underwater flight trainer. This is for Steve Fawcett, uh, Deep Flight Challenger, is now owned by um, Richard Branson, Sir Richard. He got into a uh, kind of race to the bottom with James Cameron and lost. Um, <laughs> but um, this was about two months away from being launched, one month away from being launched when we lost Steve. So had Steve lived, that would have been at the bottom of the planet about four years ago. But this is the best machine here. I want to show you this one. This is the Super Falcon. This is Tom. No doubt Tom's in the front. Um, Tom's view is he has a great car collection. Um, and if you own a Ferrari, you don't give the keys to the chauffeur. You have a Ferrari because you drive it. He has this because he flies this thing. There's a basic forces on this thing. It's not a submersible. It actually is. We don't know what to call it. It isn't a submersible and it isn't an airplane. For goodness sakes, it's not in air. But if you want to convey the words of something new when the name doesn't yet exist, air, underwater airplane is just a pretty good way of describing it. Exactly the same um, set of forces, except a mirror image of an aircraft. We keep this fixed positive buoyant, so we have a 10% of its mass is a buoy net buoyancy force, which is trying to bring it back up to the surface. So the main wing you see there has a normal lift section inverted so that at cruise speed, you're actually pulling down and countering that buoyancy force. And then all you've got to do, of course, is to add thrust, which is water ingested through the back, ejected out the back, uh, counter the drag and the lift. And then we have your control by vertical rudders, elevator, used to be called horizontal rudders, pretty obvious, and aerolons. It's fly-by-wire. And the thing is just beautiful. It's just extraordinary. I'm in love, still in love with this machine all this while. About last year, we finished the, um, the extreme maneuvers with the thing. Um, we've had it now vertical, upside down. And after 20 years of being a designer and engineer, I've now got to figure out, we really are figuring out what we do with the next 10 years of actually how we use these things on an ocean planet. And this is the future. OK, pay attention now. You're looking at the future. Forget the machine. These will develop into other ones. Um, hopefully, they'll all be based back on where we are now. But that's the future right there, that face. Not this one, that one. <laughs> the reason is that that is not the usual suspects. That is not a gray-bearded ex-astronaut brave ocean explorer, you know. That's my daughter. She was 12 at the time. She's now 13. Beautiful smile in the back. Her brother, this is Madeline. Oliver and Madeline have been in here. I've discovered shipwrecks with Oliver. We took Madeline down here, and we found some lionfish that were rather gorgeous. These two kids are growing up believing that everybody's dad is like this guy in the front. And access to this planet is open to the future. It hasn't been open to you. It hasn't been open to me. You haven't been able to go below scuba depth on this planet. You haven't been able to access the bulk, the main reason, the reason this planet exists. As human beings, we haven't had workable access. You haven't. Your parents didn't. Your kids will. That's our little crazy team. They are a little bit crazy, actually. And here's where we're going with this thing. Um, it's been a long time figuring out where we're going. We thought we were going to the bottom of the planet to set a record for somebody, um, for Steve Fawcett. Um, that sub, you know, as I mentioned, was bought. It's actually bought by a fellow name of Chris Walsh. And Chris sold, I believe, an interest in the deep sub to Virgin, to Richard Branson. So here's a little video clip. That little white, that fellow in the back there is actually Richard Branson. That's me in the front. This is a few months ago. So what happens? What happens if you can go fly in the ocean? Here we are. There's me. There's Richard. He's going to give a little thumbs up, his usual thing, or V-sign, I think. Come, Richard, V-sign. Nope. Uh, oh, there it is. 
<laughs> a buddy of mine had a dive boat up here and was reporting great whites. Great whites actually as big as this, cruising around down here. And I've always said, you know, we could go fly, get into a dogfight with a great white. On the back of this uh, is a tripod. There's a small camera. It's all we've got. I'm very sorry, but that's all there was. So this is now the dive. And if you look up there, if you can just see, <laughs> there's an outline of a great white. It's laying in ambush. We're stu too silly. We don't see it. We don't even notice it now. Here she is coming in. She's as big as the sub. And what she's doing is she's challenged. <laughs> you see the sub shaking? That's actually just vortex off the camera thing. But it's a, an appropriate shake. Because what she's doing here is she's coming in um, with a routine, a challenge routine. She's challenging us for, um, I guess, the space. And fortunately, these big animals don't bite each other. They're rather smarter than that. Not in the first instance. <laughs> what they do is they will come in, go alongside each other, look at each other, and the smaller one, being quite smart, even with a pea brain, will go, OK, I'm out of here. Um, in this case, we're too dumb to do that. And fortunately, I think the animal, that animal that was there was um, about six meters long, probably. Uh, it, it was just so much bigger than it looked in that, this, this super wide angle on there. She weighed as much as the sub. Um, we should have been terrified, but we were two Englishmen. We were giggling away, talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story, but it can't leave this room, right? What happens in Chicago? <laughs> So Richard and I are flying back. We're, we're hooting and hollering. We're having, we had the most magnificent encounter. By the way, to be in the presence of that predator, um, we weren't giggling. It's, it's, it's um, awesome. That's all there's one word for it. I was looking in her eye, knowing she could just turn around and just take a big wing off of this thing. Um, we probably would have been all right. We figured that out ahead of time. But when we, when we were going back, we were giggling and laughing. Um, I was flying the thing about 40 feet under the bottom. Some sunlight was coming in. When sunlight comes in, these, by the way, these domes are really rather magical. The material is, has a refractive index very close to water. So the light is reflecting off of here. But the sensation inside is that dome is optically dissolved. It's gone. It's like flying an open two-seater. It's just extraordinary. But when you get close to the surface, Sunlight can come in, it can reflect off, and you can notice the domes, and you do get reflections. So bear that in mind. Bear in mind that Richard, I better be polite here, Sir Richard has a big set of chompers. He has a big set of teeth and um, big jaw. So we're going back. I can't see him, but we've got earpieces, and suddenly he screams in my ear, oh my god, there's another one. I start throwing this thing around, looking for where these teeth are attacking from. And I can't see anything. And I'm saying, Richard, what is it? What? What? And then he starts laughing. His, his little giggle starts building in my ear. He says, no, 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 Graham, it's all right. I just saw a reflection of my own teeth in the dark. <laughs> True story, but, but probably not for publication. OK, here's, um, <laughs> here, here is a few months before that um, Gulf of Aqaba. We were flying a bunch of scientists for, um, what if I can stop this thing? There again, you, you saw that face in the back there. Just let this run and then that will be it. This is Gulf of Aqaba. We're really there flying uh, seven scientists up and down from the Saudi border to the Israeli border, up and down, um, doing a ground tooth. We had um, HD cameras, laser scaling stuff, guys in the back make, frantically making notes, really looking surveying the deep water corals. These are the lionfish that um, Madeline likes so much. So that's where we're at. We've, we've built underwater flight. We think we've opened the ocean. It's a hell of a deal. It's fantastic. It's fabulous. And um, you know, we've gone from, now we've gone from a two-seater. We think we need to start looking at small passenger craft. So we're looking at stretching this thing 
and opening um, underwater adventures. So that, that's, that's the next company. Um, the, there is a contact on there. You may want to take note of that. We are going, we have another expedition called the Whale Song. We're trying to now bring in the public. We actually can't bring in the public, but we can invite, we can make private invitations. So here's a private invitation to all of you in this room. It's not public. There's a, um, I know you're not supposed to do flagrant sales things. This really isn't, but what the heck. You know, I'm doing, a, uh, doing an Eastwood. I'm on the stage. I've got the mic, and there's no controls. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we do have two or three places, and we've just made some great friends. So we do have a couple of places. If you want to take this guy's place, we're going in February. What we think we can do in blue Hawaiian waters is to get down um, around about 200 feet, just below scuba. It's still nice and light, very comfortable, very smooth, and listen to whale songs in situ with external hydrophones. Years ago, as a kid, I was in the water uh, with scuba, and a humpback was singing. And um, it's a religious experience. I mean, th this is a song that goes on up for 30 minutes. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with their songs, but they go to high frequencies, low. If you look at this data, it's a massive amount of data. It's not repeated, and they all say the same thing. It's a heck of a mystery. It, it, it's the greatest unsolved alien life form mystery this side of the galaxy. <laughs> We're not going to solve it. We're going to listen to it. Uh, there's a couple of places. Uh, take a note of that, and I've got some flies in. So thank you very much. Thank you.